Let's continue the spinal cord and look at nerves. <clears throat> First of all, think about the structure of a peripheral nerve. When you look at nerves, primarily what you're looking at are bundles of axons. Remember, axons are the output part of a neuron, and there are a large number of them in the body. So if you were to grab a bundle of axons, that's primarily what a nerve is. But surrounding these axons, you may also see Schwann cells. Remember how they provide the myelin sheath in places. It's like electric insulation. And then there's also some connective tissue layers you see in and around nerves. Now look at these prefixes you see on the first of each one. Often they'll help you out as far as their location. Endo, which is inner. The endoneurium is a connective tissue sheath and layer surrounding individual neurons and axons. So that's why it help to insulate those. There's the perineurium that surrounds axon groups, which are called fascicles. So an axon bundle is a fascicle. Perineurium is what surrounds those. And then there's the epi, the outer, epineurium that surrounds the entire nerve. So the location is really the only thing that's different about each one. But looking back at spinal nerves, remember there are 31 pairs. So that's 62 total. 31 on the left, 31 on the right. The very first spinal nerve actually comes out the bottom of the skull. Remember that big frame and magnum, that hole in the bottom of it? Between the skull and the atlas, which is the first cervical vertebrae, is where you'll see the first one. Then when you look at these other spinal nerves, they come out through the intervertebral foramen. If you look at the vertebrae laterally from the side, you will see holes in between them. Those are the intervertebral foramen. Spinal nerves come in and out of those holes. Often if somebody maybe dislocates a disc in their uh, back in between the bodies of the vertebrae, sometimes it'll slip over to the side left or right and put pressure on a nerve in one of these foramen, and that'll often cause a lot of chronic pain. The last four pairs of spinal nerves exit through the sacral foramen. Remember those are holes in the sacrum, <laughs> that big bone you see down there in your pelvis. So altogether, there's eight pairs of cervical. 12 pairs of thoracic, 5 pair of lumbar, 5 pair of sacral, and 1 pair of coccygeal. So it's 31 pairs total. Look at how these spinal nerves have been named. Use letters and numbers as sort of an abbreviation. Now remember when it comes to cervical nerves, cervical spinal nerves, there are 8 of them. So you got C1 through C8. And always start superior and move down inferior. So the very first one at the top is C1. Go down to C8. Then you got T1 to T12 in the thoracic region, L1 to L5 in the lumbar region, S1 to S5 in the sacral, and then CO for the one in the coccygeal region. And sometimes with these spinal nerves, you may see in your book a picture of a dermatomal map. And what that shows are areas of the skin that these spinal nerves are sensory to. If somebody has some damage to one of these spinal nerves, you can take a sharp object like a pen and touch areas of the skin. If they don't feel anything there, it can help you to identify which spinal nerves may have been damaged. But looking at different branches of these spinal nerves, remember that there are dorsal and ventral branches. That's what ramus are. So looking at these dorsal branches, they tend to innervate deep muscles of the trunk of the body. They're responsible for movements of the vertebral column and the skin near the midline of the back. The ventral ramus, what they innervate depends on where they're located along the spinal cord. So if you look at some of these ventral ramus in the thoracic region, they form intercostal nerves. These are inter, will innervate intercostal muscles and skin over the thorax. And those intercostal muscles in between your ribs are important muscles when it comes to ventilation. We'll see that in another chapter. The remaining spinal nerves in these ventral branches tend to form roots and plexus. And there are five major plexus with many nerves inside of them that we want to look at. So look at these different nerve plexus. C1 to C4 forms the cervical plexus. C5 to T1, the brachial plexus. L1 to L4, <clears throat> the lumbar plexus. L4 to S4, the sacral plexus. And then S4 and S5, the coccygeal plexus. So let's go to that cervical plexus, C1 to C4. This will innervate superficial neck structures, skin of the neck, and the posterior part of your head.
Within it, there's a region called the ansa cervicalis, which means handle of the neck in Latin. And what it is is a nerve loop formed between C1 and C3. But within this cervical plexus, there's a very important nerve called the phrenic nerve. This inner innervates the diaphragm muscle. <clears throat> that diaphragm muscle is the big prime mover when it comes to moving air in and out of your lungs. This phrenic nerve gets damaged and that diaphragm muscle won't work. Somebody's probably going to stop moving air in and out of their lungs. <clears throat> Look within the brachial plexus. Again, this is C5 to T1. Now, there are several nerves within this brachial plexus. We want to look at these and see what it is they're responsible for. So looking at the axillary nerve within the brachial plexus, this innervates some important muscles like the deltoid and the teres minor. The radial nerve innervates extensors of the upper limb like the triceps brachii, the brachioradialis, and some of the extensors of the hand and wrist. Remember, the extensors are what straighten your wrist and your fingers. If somebody walks incorrectly with crutches where they put the pressure under their arm, they might damage this radial nerve, and if those extensors of the wrist aren't working, the wrist will drop. That's why crutch paralysis is sometimes called wrist drop. Again, within the brachial plexus, we have the musculocutaneous nerve innervates biceps, brachii, and brachialis. Then we have the ulnar nerve. And this is what sometimes people refer to as their funny bone. The ulnar nerve is a very exposed nerve, probably the most exposed in the body, and it's right behind your elbow. That's the tip of your ulna there at that olecranon process. You turn around and smash your elbow on something, when you get that pain, that's that ulnar nerve which was struck. And then within the brachial plexus, we also have this median nerve. That one is associated with carpal tunnel syndrome. That generally happens when somebody overuses their wrist. These days, a lot of it happens when somebody's working a keyboard for hours and they don't have their hand and wrist in a comfortable position. That'll cause inflammation of the wrist, puts pressure on the median nerve, and that causes pain. So again, looking at those, there's the axillary. This nerve here will laterally rotate the humerus. The teres minor muscle will do that for you there abducts the arm, that's largely the deltoid muscle, and it's sensory to the skin in the shoulder region. Then again, back to the radial nerve. This innervates extensors of the upper limb, like the triceps brachii, brachialis, brachioradialis, and extensors of the hand and wrist. Again, that's the one associated with crutch paralysis. This is sensitive to the skin in the posterior part of the upper limb and the lateral two-thirds on the dorsal side of the hand. Going back to that musculocutaneous nerve, this innervates the anterior muscles of the arm. She's so talking about movements of the shoulder, elbow, and wrist. You're looking at the biceps, brachii, and brachialis muscles being innervated by this nerve. And it's sensory to skin on the surface of your forearm. Going to the ulnar nerve, this innervates a few of the muscles of your wrist, fingers, and hand. Again, this is the one you call your funny bone. It's very exposed behind your elbow. You smash it and it hurts. And this is sensitive to skin in the medial third of the hand, little finger, and medial half of your ring finger. Looking at the median nerve, this is associated with movements of the hand, wrist, fingers, and thumb. Some of the flexors of the wrist and fingers are innervated by this median nerve. It's sensitive to the skin in the lateral two-thirds of the palm thumb, index, and middle fingers, lateral half of the ring finger, and dorsal tips of some of the same fingers. Carpal tunnel syndrome, remember, is associated with this median nerve. Now we go down to the lumbosacral plexus. Now this is actually a combination of the lumbar and sacral. Now the lumbar is L1 to L4 and sacral is L4 to S4. So since these two work together, generally they're just grouped. So we take lumbar and sacral plexus, put them together into lumbosacral. Now there are four big nerves associated with this plexus here. The obturator, femoral, tibial, and common fibula. Looking at that obturator nerve, this innervates muscles which adduct. Remember that's to bring those lower limbs together. Adducts the thigh and knee. Muscles innervated include the adductor magnus, adductor longus, and adductor brevis. This is sensory to skin in the superior middle, middle, middle side of your thigh. Then there's the femoral nerve. Movements of the hip and knee are those largely associated with this femoral. This innervates nerves like the iliopsis sartorius and the quadriceps femoris muscle group. 
That's the four biggest muscles in your body, right there on the anterior surface of your thigh. It's sensitive to skin in the anterior and lateral regions of the thigh and medial parts of the leg and foot. Then back to the tibial nerve. The tibial and common fibular, again, are often grouped together to form the sciatic nerve. You've probably heard of that right there. But this tibial nerve is associated with movements of the hip, knee, foot, and toes. Some very major important muscles innervated by it are the gastrocnemius, soleus, and the hamstrings. Remember, that includes the biceps femoris, the semimembranosus, and the semitendinosus. Then you got this common fibular nerve. This common fibular nerve is associated with anterior and lateral muscles of the leg and foot, and also some of the fibular muscles. Then lastly, <clears throat> we have this coccygeal plexus. That's down at S5. So now we're getting down towards the very end of all these nerves right here. That S5 is sometimes called the coccygeal nerve. It can innervate some of the muscles of the pelvic floor, and it's also sensory to the skin over that coccyx, your little tailbone down there. And looking at peripheral nervous system disorders, something you might have heard of before. Looking at more general disorders, you can talk about anesthesia, which means a loss of sensation. There's hyperesthesia, which is an increased sensitivity to things like pain, pressure, and light. There's paresthesia. Here's where you get a tingling, prickling, or burning sensation. Neuralgia, which is nerve inflammation. That often causes a stabbing pain. Sciatica, pain radiating down the back of the thigh and leg. There are infections of the peripheral nervous system. Herpes, causing skin lesions. Shingles, also called the herpes zoster. That's basically where the chickenpox virus comes back on a person as an adult and affects them a second time. Poliomyelitis, often called infantile paralysis because it can cause loss of function of some of the muscles down in the lower limbs and others. Anesthetic leprosy, a bacterial infection of the peripheral nerves. And then looking at things like autoimmune disorders, myasthenia gravis is relatively common. This is an autoimmune disease where the ligand-gated sodium channels on skeletal muscle, which are sensitive, receptive to acetylcholine, get destroyed. If your immune system destroys those ligand-gated sodium channels on skeletal muscle, there's nothing for acetylcholine to bind to and those muscles are gonna stop working. That happens to very big important muscles like that diaphragm muscle, somebody's gonna stop breathing. 